Thank you for uh, joining us on this sunny, wintry day. Uh, welcome to all of you. Welcome to Dr. Michael O'Hanlon. Uh, Michael, as you know, joins us from the Brookings Institution, where he's director of research and of the foreign policy program. Uh, we like to think of ourselves here at CGSR as a bridge between the technical world and the policy and military worlds. Uh, and uh, Michael's the embodiment uh, of this in his training and, and background. Uh, undergraduate work in physics, uh, but graduate work in uh, the softer side of things, public and international affairs, Princeton University PhD. Uh, he joined Brookings 25 years ago after serving in the Peace Corps, the Congressional Budget Office, and the Institute for Defense Analyses. Uh, most of you will know some slice of his work. Uh, there is almost nobody except perhaps his mother and wife who knows the full range of his work. He's written on an astonishingly uh, broad menu of issues over 25 years uh, with a record of uh, distinguished uh, intellectual leadership uh, on uh, topics. Uh, his most recent monograph, for example, Beyond NATO, A New Security Architecture for Eastern Europe, uh, the book before that, this is in the last uh, three years, uh, Beyond NATO, The Future of Land Warfare, uh, and the $650 billion bargain, an argument about defense spending in the United States, uh, and a book on uh, U.S. China, or a chapter in a book on U.S. China strategic relations. Uh, he has an abiding interest in technology, technology change, technology's impact on national security, defense policy, defense capabilities. Uh, in 1990, he wrote, no, uh, in 2000, missed by a decade. Uh, in 2000, he wrote a book uh, on um, technology change and the future of warfare. Uh, he recently turned around and looked backward at this, the inter intervening 20-year period uh, and, and took an assessment, uh, published, uh, well, is it, is it published? Uh, a retrospective on the so-called revolution in military affairs, the RMA, that is out. Uh, and uh, I think the, the launching point for the piece of work we're going to hear about uh, is that this 20-year time frame retrospectively provides a baseline and a way of beginning to think about forecasting the emerging technology environment. Uh, Mike's agreed to set out some opening arguments for 45 minutes or so, uh, and then we'll, we'll shift to the Q&A format. Uh, the talk is on the record. The Q&A portion will be off the record. Uh, please join me in welcoming Michael O'Hanlon. Thank you, Brad. Thank you. Thank you all. It's really a privilege to be here. I think it's my third or fourth visit to Lawrence Livermore in my career. When I was at CBO, I was one of the two nuclear weapons analysts, and this was the early 90s when you were all thinking of how do we keep a stockpile safe all of a sudden without any testing and other such developments that were underway. So I was privileged to be able to come out then and learn about budgetary options for the nuclear weapons custodianship operation and mission, the science-based program that was developing in that period. And then for the book that Brad so kindly mentioned that I wrote in 2000, I came out, and I'll get into that when I discuss my methodology for the book, because part of the methodology is talking to people like you who know more about it uh, more about the subject than I. And so uh, let me explain a little bit about how I have tried to go through this iterative process. In this particular book, unfortunately, I didn't get to Livermore until after the final uh, print was put down on paper. I went to the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, which is probably like junior college by your standards, but pretty, pretty good by Washington standards. And so I did try to replicate a little bit of the earlier methodology, but this will help me today. Your feedback will help me uh, going forward, even if it doesn't change what's going to be in in either the paper that's now already online or the book uh, that's coming forth. I'm going to say a little bit more about the book so you know why I decided to do this. I don't claim that a guy with a physics undergrad, uh, engineering master's, and then a soft PhD um, can tell the world how to project trends in warfare and military technology over 20 years. I didn't, in other words, if that was the entire scope of what I was trying to accomplish, I wouldn't have thought I was the right guy to do it. But because I was trying to link it to a broader argument about strategy and budgeting, I decided I needed to try to do it for my own sake uh, 
and to the extent that I made mistakes, hope that other people would find them and correct them. And so that's part of this ongoing process. I want to say also a word of appreciation to Brad, who has really been one of my role models over the years and decades for, for juxtaposing strategic and policy thinking with technological sophistication. We don't have enough people like that in the United States. I suspect we have a lot in Livermore. We don't have enough in Washington. And so uh, I'm grateful for that uh, as well and grateful for the chance to interact with you today. So what I would like to do is ultimately spend a little bit of time walking you through these handouts. I realize this is dangerous. It's sort of like a guy who played double-A baseball coming in and talking to the New York Yankees about how to do hitting or you know, uh, claim to put on a, a, a clinic somehow on, on batting. What I'm actually going to ask, however, is in a way the opposite. I want you to view this as a rough cut, even though it's unfortunately now going to be published as such. But to the extent that you don't agree with specific assessments, I would be grateful. But let me tell you why I did this, why you have these three or four pages before you. That's the only handout, but it's not the ultimate essence of my project. In fact, this book that I've just finished, which is called The Senkaku Paradox, Risking Great Power War Over Limited Stakes, uh, has these technology assessments and chapters as now the appendices. And I'll, I'll, I started the project thinking I might redo the 2000 book. The 2000 book uh, was an effort to understand the debate about the revolution of military affairs that I know many of you in this room are well familiar with. And in the 1990s, in that halcyon period without any great hegemonic threats and American unipolarity, whatever you want to call it, it didn't, by the way, for those of us old enough to remember, it didn't always seem quite so dominant at the time, did it? I mean, we, we uh, pulled out of Somalia after one bad day of fighting in 1993. We, um, we didn't get involved in Balkans wars because we couldn't think of a smart way to do it that would be successful with modest casualties, and it took us several years to find a way to even help stabilize that situation over time. We intervened above 15,000 feet from the air in Kosovo because we didn't want to risk casualties, and it worked out okay. Uh, I co-authored a book on that called Winning Ugly, NATO's War to Save Kosovo. But the first order effect was that a million Kosovar Albanians were driven from their homes, and if Slobodan Milosevic had wanted to have his militias slaughter them, he could have because our military effectiveness in that period was not adequate, flying above 15,000 feet on cloudy Balkan days without even having special, force, special forces on the ground to do spotting and lasing for targeting, that these, this unipolarity of the 1990s wasn't necessarily quite what it was cracked up to be in retrospect. But nonetheless, you know what I mean. In the 1990s, we had this period. We had just had Desert Storm. We saw laser-guided bombs on television. It finally seemed like all the stealth and precision and satellite revolutions that people like you had been creating or your, your predecessors had been building uh, over the decades of the Cold War had culminated in an amazing high-tech military machine that now foreshadowed even a more radical and revolutionary period in technological advancement. And people were talking about how Moore's Law would not just apply to computers, but it would apply to many other domains of defense technology. And I remember Defense Science Board briefings that said the oceans will become transparent. I remember Army War College briefings that said that by the year 2010, ground vehicles won't have to weigh more than 20 tons because they'll be able to sort of like Muhammad Ali, fly like a butterfly and sting like a bee and see the incoming before they get hit and maneuver out of the way or fire out uh, an anti uh, you know, tow missile projectile to defend themselves because their sensor networks will be so good. And we know how a lot of these predictions turned out. We actually know from physics that a lot of them were sort of crazy to begin with, like the idea of the oceans becoming transparent. And so as, a, a, as sort of a you know, uh, once physicist, once aspiring physicist at Brookings in this 1990s debate, I heard all this stuff. And I said, well, this is sort of typical Washington you know, exaggeration. We're getting ourselves worked up. Everybody's got to have a big theory the revolution of military affairs is a big theory that sounds fun, and maybe it's pretty harmless. But then in 1997, uh, a, the National Defense Panel, an independent review panel that looked at the quadrennial defense review of that year, came out and said, we should stop doing as much peacekeeping. We should pull back from forward deployments and deterrence commitments around the world. We should reduce our role in alliances because we have to put more resources into the RMA because we are at such, such a cusp of warfare that if we don't do this, 
we could be vulnerable to somebody else doing it to us. And so we're going to have to give up on some important things in order to have the resources to innovate even more radically. I'm not saying that there was zero merit to that argument, but it was, to me, a dangerous argument. Because now it was combining a somewhat naive view about which areas of technology really were ripe for rapid improvement with a argument for pullback from an alliance network that I thought was the number one reason that we had won the Cold War and that one that had to be sustained and built upon, not pulled back from. So that's when I decided to write the book in 2000. And my methodology was very simple. So now I'll start to bring you along with me into where I want to go in this talk and in this new book. But the, my methodology was very simple. I said, some of the stuff I'm hearing out there, I just know is wrong because I remember my sophomore year physics. I remember the graph on electromagnetic radiation penetration of salt water. Basically, the, the short answer is it doesn't, right? Except maybe in some very low frequency radio domains. Or if you're on a nice Caribbean vacation and you're looking at a blue-green laser or blue-green light coming through perfectly clear water, maybe you get light down to 150 meters. Otherwise, water stops stuff. And it doesn't stop sonar, because sonar is a, is a wave, a sound wave, pressure wave. But when I came out to Livermore and other places in that period, I heard what I thought was already true, and it was confirmed by people I talked to, which is sonar is not changing that fast these days. You know? And so the more I try to start just asking around, and dredging up my memories of my basic high school or college physics, and then talk to state-of-the-art scientists doing the innovation, I started to realize a lot of what was being said in the RMA debate was made up. It was wishful thinking by people who didn't know the technology. And it was dangerous, because now it was starting to argue for pullbacks in a lot of military capabilities that I thought were important for general deterrence in order to fund this all-out effort to remake the military in a way that I didn't think was very realistic. And by the way, there were some very specific uh, consequences of that, like the Army's future combat system program, where the Army said, we're going to remake our entire vehicle fleet inventory in the next 10 to 20 years based on all these new technologies, based on ideas of lightness, mobility, self-defense, sensor awareness, and Lo and behold, it took the Army 10 years to figure out that it better not do that. The entire program was essentially ultimately canceled. Some good things came out of it. All apologies to any of you who worked on it. There were very good people working within it. But the theory of the case was wrong, in my humble opinion. And the theory of the case, this grandiose notion that we were in a position to reinvent the nature of ground combat, or at least ground, uh, ground combat vehicles, was not based on serious technical work. Another example, remember the old expendable launch vehicle debate of the 1990s, where we were going to cut costs of putting satellites into orbit by 90%. That's what people were saying, not people like you. <laughs> people like you knew that we didn't have any huge breakthroughs that were looming in propellants. You knew the rocket equation. You knew the basic transfer momentum. If you don't change the efficiency of your propellant, if you don't make the rocket body a whole lot lighter, there's just no other way in which you're going to make space launch a whole lot less expensive, or at least the burden of proof is on people who would say otherwise. But it was very popular in Washington defense policy circles to say we're going to cut the cost of space launch by 90%. So there was a bunch of stuff out there that I just was pretty sure was wrong. And I needed a methodology to investigate, um, and instead of just taking a few cheap shots here and there, so I created this very simple, straightforward method, which I don't claim to be in any way perfect, and it's certainly not perfect with my brain, the one that's you know, applying it, because I'm not the PhD in physics or engineering that most of you or many of you are. But I thought, if I, first of all, remember my sophomore physics, which is going to tell me about the limits of the possible and the impossible in a number of areas. For example, low Earth orbit satellites don't loiter over a certain spot on Earth, and they won't, and they can't, and they shall never. Little things like that that were sometimes lost in some sloppy thinking about how we're going to build a, you know, I'm not saying that space-based uh, missile defense is impossible, but you're going to have to factor in absentee ratios. I'm not saying that it's impossible to find things in the oceans. But you've got to remember that any electromagnetic radiation doesn't tend to move very far through water. Just things like that. So I created a list of 29 uh, specific areas of technology, which is on the first page. And 
and I first try to think through my physics. Then I try to read the defense literature, you know, Aviation Week, et cetera. Then I try to uh, talk to technologists. And then I also tried to go look at specific weapons programs that I knew were already being built or attempted, uh, which showed where we might be in 20 years because the F-35 was in its R&D program back then. A lot of things that are now being deployed were already in the works 20 years ago. So if I thought, I thought if I kept a 20-year time horizon, it wasn't super hard to see into the future because a lot of what we were going to have 20 years hence was actually already in the R&D pipeline by necessity, just because of how we do things. Not everything, but a lot of things. So that was essentially my methodology, and I wanted to project out to 2020. And I wound up concluding, out of those 29 areas of technology, that computer hardware and computer software would probably undergo revolutionary change. And I'll define what I mean by that in just a second. But that nothing else out of the list would. Some of the other 27 categories might undergo relatively rapid change, but it would not be of a fundamentally different quality or character. It would be improved performance, you know, 50%, something like that. But it wouldn't take us to a whole new threshold or a whole new capability that we hadn't previously enjoyed. And then other things would probably grow more like 10 or 20% in performance. Sonar, for example, or existing types of chemical weapons detectors. There were a few examples that jumped to mind where I just thought it was pretty clear we weren't going to have huge new breakthroughs. And because we were not asking you all to develop new types of nuclear weapons, whatever the physics and science might have allowed, I also didn't think we would see big new breakthroughs in nuclear weapons effects. So I went through, again, the 29. And you've got it here before you. This, is, this first table is taken right from my book that was published 20 years ago. And, and then what I realized I needed to do for my current project was to go back and evaluate my own methodology. You might say, well, great, you're grading your own homework. You're probably going to be nicer on yourself than somebody else might have been. So, uh, and I take that point, and you're allowed to be much tougher graders here in a minute when I finish my talk. But I, I went through, and you'll see on page two, where, um, where I went through that same list of projections. And then in the fourth column, the revised um, column, I tried to acknowledge where I thought I got some things wrong. Either I was too bullish on how fast the technology was improving or likely to improve, or I was uh, uh, you know, too bearish. And what I basically concluded is that I was right, that computer hardware and computer software did undergo <coughs> revolutionary change. But I should have been, um, I should have also put robotics in the category of revolutionary change. And I probably should have put computer vulnerability in the area or in the category of revolutionary change because we continued to put all this software into our defense systems that we couldn't really vouch for or defend or make resilient. And even though we had been through the Y2K uh, scare, we sort of assumed because we didn't have hegemonic threats in the day, we were trying to buy commercial off-the-shelf technology, everybody loved Bill Gates, let's all put Windows software into our defense systems too, why not? So it seemed to me over the following 20 years, I, had, I should have had a separate category, which would have been computer vulnerability. And then I should have assessed that as likely to undergo revolutionary change in a bad way, at least from an American national security perspective. So there were a few other areas, some where I thought I was a little, again, where I thought it should have been moderate instead of high or high instead of moderate. But basically, in terms of areas that were undergoing revolutionary change, my conclusion was the first two decades of the 21st century we really, out of these categories, only saw revolutionary progress in computers and robotics, to be, to be short and blunt and concise and to finally bring it all home. And you can debate me on that in a minute if you like. But I basically concluded that I was mostly right to have counseled caution back in the year 2000 about the likelihood that we were going to undergo any wide-ranging revolution in military affairs. <coughs> Sorry. Still getting over an East Coast cold that was exacerbated by Afghanistan last week. So um, a little bit of that cobble crud in my throat. I'm still trying to work to get out. Now, what I then decided I should try to do <coughs> is take the same technology matrix or set of uh, subcomponents and try to examine with the same kind of methodology where things might go in the next 20 years. And at first, I was going to do this just out of pure intellectual interest. 
And I started the book project without really knowing what larger question I wanted to answer, except to go back to the methodology. I was curious to see how well I had done. I was curious to try to figure out what I had gotten wrong and why, see if I could improve the methodology, and then try to apply it for the next 20 years. And then ultimately link that to a strategic problem. And the problem I decided to ultimately link it to was this question of what I call the Senkaku paradox. What I'm worried about in strategic terms is Russia or China not you know, attacking the main, island of, the main islands of Japan, not attacking or annexing an entire Baltic country, although maybe that's possible in the most distant realms of one's imagination, but it didn't strike me as very likely. But what I thought was more likely was one day we wake up and China has taken one of the uninhabited Senkaku Islands that Japan claims, China claims. We don't have a US government position on whose they are. However, we do acknowledge publicly that the United States-Japan Mutual Security Treaty applies to the Senkaku Islands, even though we don't have a view on whose they really are, because we do acknowledge and recognize that Japan administers them. Whatever the hell that means for uninhabited islands, where there's no economic activity and not even any Girl Scout or Boy Scout uh, ecological trips. So what does it mean to administer the Senkaku Islands? I don't really know, but we are now in this bind. And then I, I had a good friend, um, great guy, Lieutenant General John Whistler. He had been a Brookings Fellow 20 years ago, and he went on to great things in the Marine Corps. He's now retired, but he was the head of 3MEF in the Pacific. <coughs> and about four years ago, a Japanese journalist asked him on the record, what should we do if one day we wake up and the Chinese have taken a Senkaku Island? And he said something that I think was exactly the right thing for him to say, given his position, but probably exactly the wrong thing for us to do if this scenario actually happens. He said, we should take it back. And then he said, maybe we don't have to take it back. Maybe we can bomb the Chinese positions. In other words, we're going to start using lethal force against a nuclear-armed, almost superpower over an uninhabited island of one square mile size with no inhabitants, for which we have no official US government position as to whose it really even is. <coughs> and it got me thinking that this is an example of a broader problem set of situations where Russia or China might have an incentive to sort of stoke a problem, not because they care so much about a Senkaku Island or one little farming town in eastern Estonia that's Russian majority speaking, but because they sense an opportunity to weaken the US alliance system and US led global order system. Because if they, can you imagine how much fun Russia would have if they foment some kind of a disturbance in eastern Estonia? One native Russian gets killed, probably got killed by an FSB guy on purpose to make it look like it was an Estonian nationalist doing it. Russia uses that as an excuse to send in little green men. They take that town. No one additional has been killed. They present the world with a fed accompli, and then they wait for NATO to decide what to do in response. What's NATO going to do in that situation? Half of NATO is going to want to pretend it never happened, or we can talk it back, or it's not worth World War III in any event. And the United States, probably, and a couple of other countries, and certainly Estonia, are going to want to liberate that town as fast as possible. That would be my prediction of how the debate would begin. And Putin's just going to sit back and have fun. By the way, I don't think Putin is all that likely to do this, but his successor might, because his successor might have the same worldview as Putin, that he wants to weaken the US-led order, but not have the same cunning. I think Putin, for all of his moral fl flaws, uh, is probably a tactically pretty smart operator and probably calculates what he can get away with pretty well, like Syria or Donbass or Crimea. But he hasn't yet directly, physically attacked a NATO member state, but he does a cyber attack. So he's always testing what he can get away with. My guess is he knows this scenario that I've just mentioned is not one that it's really worth you know, testing our resolve. But it would be a wonderful way to see NATO tied up in knots as we debate amongst ourselves how to respond. <coughs> and so I wanted to examine this set of scenarios, which I think technology is making harder every year. Because the basic idea of projecting power against a position near enemy territory when they know you're coming is, of course, um, a, a subcategory of the broader 
uh, anti-access area denial kinds of capabilities that we know that many countries can develop in a high technology era. And certainly countries with the resources of, Russia, of China or even Russia can do so. And now the technology is increasingly available to many of them. So I think this trend in warfare is ongoing. That's why I wanted to do this assessment. I wanted to think about areas of technology that might evolve or change or improve with time and then try to put them into my net assessment of how these kinds of wars might go. And my ultimate argument in the book is these kind of scenarios do not lend themselves to a direct symmetric military response. And we're better off thinking of asymmetric military and economic responses that would be more proportionate to the scale of the offense. And they might take a long time to resolve, but it's better than World War III, frankly, bluntly. So I don't want to take you through the whole book argument in detail because I want to focus more on these technologies. But that's why I wanted to ask about these different trends, not just for their own sake, although that's important in and of itself, but I wanted to plug it into my broader strategic analysis of these cases of uh, great power war over limited stakes, where the stakes themselves are not important so much as what they could foreshadow about if we let Russia or China get away with this kind of stuff, they might do worse things subsequently. And we would be seeing our allies' treaties uh, invoked and our allies' territories <laughs> insulted or taken. So we couldn't stand by and do nothing. But we would have to, we would want to find the right degree of response that caused proportionate punishment without risking escalation any more than necessary. That's the basic strategic argument that I'm trying to get into. Well, let me now come back and conclude uh, in my opening comments, and I'll, I'll try to be fairly brief, and we have plenty of time for discussion. Let me now bring it back to the technology and just explain a little bit more about how I made these prognostications and then open it up to your uh, responses. And if you like, we can go back to the um, you know, broader strategic analysis and the scenario analysis as well. But um, if you'll now, if you don't mind, turn to that second sheet, and it's the... It's the graph that's labeled um, projected advances in key deployable technologies 2020 to 2040. And it covers both the front and back of that second sheet of paper. <clears throat> and so I've got things organized into four categories. Sensors, computers and communications, projectiles, propulsion, and platforms, and then finally sort of a miscellaneous category. And so let me just sort of slow down in, in setting the overall stage and take a little bit more time on at least some of these overall categories, and then we can get into the specifics um, as you wish. And I, I, you know, I hope you'll, you'll correct me where you think I've got a basic situation wrong. But as I look at sensor technology writ large, I know there are some interesting things going on here, for example, on trying to apply uh, more advanced methods of microbiology to identify biological pathogens through faster assessment of, of DNA sequencing rather than the old days where you had to let the specimen grow, essentially, and that was your main way of finding a pathogen was to let it grow to the point where it produced enough other materials that it was identifiable. I, I know I'm caricaturing maybe some of the overall technologies here, but I think we're in some exciting places with biological weapon sensors. Uh, I'm not sure it's at a revolutionary cusp because it seems like it's taking a fair amount of time to make these deployable. It's taking a fair amount of time um, to make them cost effective and you still got to get them to where the sample is. They're not good at remote sensing. They have to be in physical contact with the specimen. So uh, I've identified or, or argued that this should be seen as an area of probably high uh, technological progress but not revolutionary progress. So again, notionally speaking, when I say high progress in quantitative ther terms, I'm thinking of maybe 50% improvement in performance to 100%. <coughs> if I say moderate progress, I'm expecting 5 to 25% improvement over the time period at question. If I think of revolutionary progress, in quantitative terms, I'm thinking of maybe a doubling or tripling of capability. Or you might say I'm thinking of a qualitatively different kind of capacity than we had before. So that's basically what I'm trying to get at with each of these categories. They're very notional. They're very approximate. Um, and so I don't want to overstate the scientific rig or the uh, mathematical precision of how I identify them. But for most other areas of sensors, <clears throat> it strikes me that 
fundamentally, the physics is still the problem because sensor performance is limited by, for many things, optical sensors, for example, or infrared by line of sight access. Uh, metal and water and soil and most building materials get in the way of most of these sensors. They're just fundamental limitations. So even though infrared sensors are more sensitive than before, and that's good, and that can have certain specific tactical applications, the basic way in which infrared sensors are affecting warfare strikes me as in an evolutionary state, not a revolutionary one. And to me, that's sort of my across-the-board assessment for most kinds of sensors. Another example would be sonar. I read a lot of the literature in the unclassified domain. And by the way, I don't have a security clearance anymore, so this whole book was done strictly at the unclass level, and obviously it's written at the unclass level. But in, in trying to go and look at um, sonar technology papers from various US Navy research facilities in Newport and Bethesda and elsewhere, it looked to me as if a lot of the innovations that were being attempted were trying to improve performance by 5, 10, 15, 20% or they were trying to map the ocean floor in a certain place to make us understand sonar reflections better for certain regions, or they were trying to uh, change the movement of uh, water around a sonar sensor in a, in a moving underwater vessel that might improve the sensitivity of the receptor a little bit. But they were not fundamentally new in phenomenology. And this, that's sort of my general point about sensors. So I'm not trying to make that completely sweeping statement. And I've already acknowledged that it does strike me that the biological weapons uh, detectors that we're now building at places like Livermore do promise a little faster improvement than what we've seen in the last 20 or 30 years and that what we might be seeing in some of the other areas of sensor technology. But generally, it strikes me we're in an era of ongoing, impressive, yet evolutionary progress in sensors. That's my broad sweeping statement for that category. I'm trying to paint with the right level of generality here to, to provoke you um, and to give you an overall sense of where I was going with the argument without trying to get too nitty gritty uh, in the presentation. Computers. Uh, you'll see here that I do now assess there are a lot of areas of likely revolutionary change in computing that will continue the revolutionary change of the last 20 to 30 years. And exactly what that means for one domain of warfare or another is going to vary, of course. Uh, so I'm not trying to say that everything is becoming obsolete because of computers. But um, if, you, if you examine a number of these areas, hardware, software, system of systems, some new categories, artificial intelligence, there are probably going to be even some more impressive things that happen in the next 20 years than we've seen in the past 20. So overall, I was trying to throw cold water on the idea of an RMA when I wrote the book 20 years ago. I'm not trying to throw cold water on the idea of a fair number of revolutionary changes in the next 20 years. I think we're poised to probably see the next 20 years be a faster period of technological progress, especially when you think not just of the pure research, but the combination of pure research with hegemonic competition, the fact that China and Russia are now back in the game, the fact that Many computing technologies have been around long enough that we're starting to get better at figuring out how to use them in really clever ways. We're marrying them up with autonomous vehicles. We're going to probably get very good at swarming technologies, either for sensor clouds, sensor grids, or even weapons that could be deployed as AI-driven swarms. And I expect that to continue and to really intensify. So for example, as I apply this to my scenarios, when I look at the, the Baltic state scenarios that I mentioned before, Imagine that Russia in the year 2035 has just created a little pretext for invoking their uh, national security platform that allows them to go and, uh, and protect Russian speakers wherever they may live on Earth. You know, that was an edict of, of Putin and some of his cronies in the last few years. And so if they want to create an argument that allows them to then cross the border into Estonia, they create this little disturbance. They get some Russian harassed or heaven forbid, killed, and, and no one knows what really happened. All of us suspect that Russia did it, but we can't prove it. And for Russia, that's reason enough to then cross over the border and seize control of that town to protect those Russian speakers. Of course, Putin doesn't really care about protecting those Russian speakers in Estonia, most of whom would much prefer not to be protected by Russia. Thank you very much in any event. But that's not Putin's interest. His interest is in sowing dissent within NATO to see if he can get the alliance to weaken or ultimately even collapse. 
which for him would be a wonderful accomplishment. So that's what I'm worried about. And I worry that if he does that, and then we try to mount a major military response, there are all sorts of things he could do to us even today. There are a lot more things he can do to us in 2035 to make that hard, well before we're in position to mount a major maneuver operation on the plains of, of the uh, Eastern Baltic region to liberate that town. And one of the things that I would worry about is swarms of uh, underwater vehicles that communicate with each other and can repair any holes in their grids that develop for one reason or another. And they can basically make it impossible to bring supply ships into any ports in the Baltics. That might be already impossible today uh, because of Russian missiles. But I think when you combine the missile threat, hypersonic threat, and the micro, micro, micro robotics threats uh, of future uh, decades, it's going to become an even more imposing uh, kind of operation to consider, which is why ultimately in the book, I argue that I think we should, we should look for non-direct asymmetric responses. So again, I'm trying to link my technology discussion here to the broader purpose of the book. But let me just say that this is an area where I expect computing to really um, take us to even higher levels, to even more radical change in the next 20 years than we've seen it accomplish in the previous 20. I may be wrong, but that's the overall assessment. So overall, in the category of computers in particular, it strikes me we're going to see revolutionary change in the next 20 years. Communications, not so much, because there are a lot of things that can be done to slow and complicate communications. We might even see a reversion of battlefield communication capabilities because of jamming, because of cyber threats. So the kind of things we could do with impunity against the Taliban or Al Qaeda, we're not going to be able to do with impunity against a peer competitor. And so communications will probably get more difficult. And whatever progress we have on you know, laser communications or frequency hopping uh, radio will probably be less than is needed just to hold our own, to tread water compared to the growing threat. So overall, I do not anticipate revolutionary progress in communications technologies the way I do in computing. Third category, and I'm going to bring this to a merciful end pretty soon so you can then start to hack at me on specifics and uh, take this into a conversation. But the area of platforms, propulsion, engines, this is the area where in the 1990s I was especially provoked by the RMA proponents because it seemed to me that initially based on physics and the more I read, almost everything they were saying sounded more wrong than right. Whether it was about this future combat system, the expendable launch vehicle, um, airplanes that would bounce along the troposphere and you know, be mass producible at reasonable cost and be able to cross continents in an hour or two. A lot of the ideas that were out there in the 1990s RMA debate assumed breakthroughs in either uh, propulsion systems or fuels or aerodynamics or hydrodynamics that just seemed to me to be at a physics level unlikely, at an engineering level not really being actively researched in most cases, and even to the extent they were, they were usually exquisite systems that would be very expensive to produce. So yes, we can produce a ship that goes 60 knots, but it's tiny by the scale of military transport. And you, know, you can do interesting things. You can capture wakes. You can do a trimaran. You can do various, you, know, you, you can invoke various interesting concepts to try to stay above the water. But when you put a big piece of metal, a big ship, in the water, we haven't figured out any new way to design that ship that makes it easy to go over 30, 35 knots very efficiently. And it's sort of striking, in fact, on this technology. You go back to World War II. Ships were almost going the same speed then they're going now. You know, the, the physics of moving through the water are just really daunting. And I'm sure a lot of you understand that better than I do, but I was struck the more I looked at it. With the ELV and rocket and space launch, you have the conservation of mass problem with, with the rocket equation. Unless your fuel is going to be a lot more efficient per unit mass, or your structural materials are going to be a whole lot lighter, or you can find a way to make the rocket reusable, and I'll come back to that, you are stuck. Cost per pound of putting satellite in orbit is very hard to change if those three physical and engineering realities stay the same. Now, if you start to make your rocket reusable, then maybe you can start talking about 25 to 50 percent cost reductions if you look at what goes into the cost of most rockets. I think very hard to get 
savings beyond that. But that would be impressive if we could do that. If you want to call that revolutionary, I don't know. What strikes me as more revolutionary is the trend in satellite technology itself going towards miniaturization. That does look revolutionary to me, and I see that as another variant of the computing and robotics revolutions that are packing more and more capability into smaller and smaller spaces. It doesn't work for everything in space, but it works for a lot of communications, for some sensing applications. And so there I would say, yes, there is uh, potential for revolutionary change. But on most vehicles, most rockets, most ships, most ground combat vehicles, most airplanes, we've been in this conundrum where it's been very hard to eke out 10 to 20 percent progress per decade for a long time. So then I asked, is that going to change? Based on what I can see going on in the weapons laboratories and the research laboratories and the design facilities today, based on what physics suggests might be viable or feasible. And my overall conclusions are that maybe there are a couple areas like hypersonic missiles where we can really expect big new things in the next 20 years. But overall, I'm going to stick with skepticism as my, as my sweeping summary of what I expect to change in the area of vehicles, propulsion, fuels, and engines. I just don't see that most things are offering radical change. And again, I very much hope and look forward to hearing whether you agree with me or not in just a minute. So most of my projections in that general realm are for either moderate or rapid change. Not to say the changes are unimportant. It could be the difference between winning and losing a given dogfight, whether you've got that 50% added performance in your engine or your fuel. But you're still going to be having dogfights. In other words, it's not taking you to a whole different type of warfare necessarily, at least not quite yet. I don't claim, by the way, to be able to see past 2040. I'm probably not seeing 2040 completely clearly. But one thing I try to do by way of some degree of intellectual humility with this kind of an exercise is, is to recognize looking more than 20 years out forces me to anticipate not just what you're doing today here, but what you might be doing in five or 10 years. And I don't think I'm really smart enough to understand what you're doing today, but I can at least talk to you and, and read the unclassified you know, magazine you put out and read a bunch of other magazines and come give talks like this and see where I'm way off base and be corralled back to a closer sense of reality. But if I try to guess where you guys are going to be in your experiments and you're thinking in 10 years, now I'm getting into pretty dangerous territory that I don't really think I can fathom. So I don't predict what platforms you'll be able to produce 2050 and beyond. I'm confining myself to the next 20 years where I think a lot of what is going to happen is already stuff that's being researched or at least conceptualized and in many cases developed and tested and prototyped just based on the sort of life cycle of military systems. And then finally, and I'll stop with this last category in the last uh, backside of page two, um, other weapons and key technologies. I don't see really, of, of all the things I list here, lasers, nanomaterials, 3D printing, uh, biological weapons, non-lethal weapons, I see a lot of room for rapid change. I don't necessarily see any of these things producing a revolution, revolutionary new way of warfare by 2040. And I know we can get into semantics. I know some of you, for example, we were just talking about it over lunch, are working on additive manufacturing. There's amazing stuff going on. But the reason why I said I don't see it as being revolutionary for the overall nature of warfare, and I'm just going to give one anecdote or one way of looking at that question. If I think to fielded forces in remote locations. Additive manufacturing can help them with spare parts. That's great, once you get the machine to whatever combat outpost you're talking about. It can help uh, with certain kinds of specific you know, uh, supplies that you might want to build. But fielded military forces are hard to field fundamentally and hard to supply fundamentally because of the need for fuel and water and food. And if you look at tonnage requirements, if you look at most of what we're moving, it's the spare parts are maybe, you know, and the munitions are maybe 10 or 20% of the total mass. So even if you can find a more efficient way to produce those in the field that relieves some strain on your manufacturing and your logistics base, the nature of that logistics operation hasn't really changed 
fundamentally, because there's no way to really be more efficient about getting water and fuel to troops through additive manufacturing. So that's the kind of argument I'm trying to make to say there could be r rapid and important progress. I just don't think it's going to change the fundamental nature of most of the military problems. Another example from this list, and I'll start to conclude up here in a second, would be non-lethal weapons. I remember I first went to Quantico to the Marine Corps non-lethal weapons research facility in 1993 or something when I was at Congressional Budget Office. And the Marine Corps had been designated, I think, as the lead um, agency for non-lethal weaponry research. And now it's 2018, and we've just fought these counterinsurgencies for almost two decades, not to mention all the policing we still do in inner cities. And what's striking to me is how almost useless almost every non-lethal technology is in these kind of tactical settings. It's really sort of stunning. And that's not meant as an aspersion on anybody working on this stuff. I mean, and I hope I'm, nothing I'm saying is coming across as critical of the technology community. I'm trying to look at sort of what's feasible and how those of us who do strategy and budgeting and force planning need to be brought back to reality based on what's doable. You know, and maybe there wasn't much that could be done with non-lethal weapons. But at a checkpoint in Iraq or Afghanistan, if in doubt, we don't tell our troops to throw down a layer of you know, high skid material so that the incoming suicide bomber won't be able to reach his target. We tell the troops to take their M4 and shoot the guy if they really have no other choice. Because, and if it's really clear what his intent is. So tactically, in these kind of settings, we're still pretty stuck with lethal weapons. Non-lethal weapons have made very little headway. And you know, I don't often just sit back and think about that reality, but this kind of a project is designed to require me to do it. So I have no particular advanced knowledge on non-lethal weapons. I'm not claiming uh, to have an alternative model of what they could achieve. I'm just observing where I think they are. And unless I'm missing something big, they're not very far at all. So it's that kind of methodology. Basic physics, observation of what we're doing in the field, observation of what weapons we're, we're producing and developing now, conversations with people who are actually doing the research, and then uh, just trying to you know, tie it all together uh, in an operational context. It's that methodology that I've tried to employ to suggest that the next 20 years of warfare may be a little bit more transformative than the last 20, which I don't think were actually all that transformative by historical standards compared to, let's say, the first 40 years of the 20th century. And, and uh, today, we may or may not be at the cusp of faster change. I think it's possible. I'm less skeptical than I was in the earlier book. Uh, for the purposes of my broader strategic argument, I'm not sure how much it matters, because I think these scenarios, like the Senkaku scenario, are already so difficult for us that uh, we're going to have a hard time marshalling a direct response anyway. So when we link this back to the scenarios that I focused on in the book, I'm not sure that uh, it matters that much whether change is high or revolutionary. But I would have to ultimately conclude with agnosticism. 20 years ago, I was a skeptic, a critic, probably uh, you know, a, a, a curmudgeon on the hypothesis that an RMA was really feasible. Today, I find myself much less sure and I think there are ways in which the different pieces could fit together that could produce some quite uh, transformative effects by 2040. So Brad, I'll stop there and look forward to the discussion. Excellent.